Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2019 Age Management Medicine Group Conference in Tucson, Arizona. Today we have Dr. Juicy Jill Stocker, a physician from West Hollywood, California, who's involved with age management medicine, and today we're going to talk about hormones and the brain. Jill, how are you doing today? I'm, it's such an honor to be here, George. Uh, this field has completely changed my life, and you were part of that, and I'm just so grateful, and I'm so excited to be able to share this. So today you gave a lecture on hormones, anxiety, bipolar disorder, brain function, and, and so on. What made you get involved in the field of age management medicine? I actually uh, started off in family medicine, and I had patients that came to me that I hadn't seen for a while, and they looked great, they had lost weight, they felt great. I said, what are you doing? They said, we're seeing a hormone doctor. And I thought, I must learn about this because they don't teach this in medical school, as you know. And I started coming to these conferences, and my life was forever changed. I didn't even realize that the symptoms that I was having of losing my hair and being tired all the time were symptoms of hormonal decline uh, and it starts as early as your 20s and 30s and there's not enough awareness about that and the first time that I took my first uh, hormone I felt like I woke up to my life and I call that my hormonal awakening and now I share that with not only my patients but with physicians uh, to so that they can also then live their best lives. Yeah, one of the uh, benefits of uh, hormone replacement therapies, as we get older, our hormones decline, metabolism slows down. Uh, for myself, uh, as a cardiologist in New York, I started to notice this in my 40s. And you know, sometimes this, this occurs uh, in men and women at different ages. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we see is a uh, lack of energy, uh, decrease in muscle tone, increased belly fat, fatigue, lack of drive and motivation, and depression, especially in men and women, is a big thing. Uh, your lecture today talked about that. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about hormonal decline and, and depression and anxiety and how the current medical community treats depression without looking at other uh, aspects of uh, the ideologies? Absolutely. This is something that's near and dear to my heart because I was affected by it. Uh, I was initially diagnosed with depression and I, it was really severe PMS and that's when the advent of vitamin P, Prozac, came out and that became my, began my hormonal journey uh, or misdiagnosis with depression and it was not until I found this field where I was woken up to my life and no longer needed those things because they were just band-aids and now I share that with my patients but one in five women is uh, affected by depression as they travel through menopause and like you mentioned you were in your 40s you know women start as early as their late 20s and 30s with having hormonal fluctuations and there's so much stigma against even sharing about it um, whether you're a woman man physician just in general that you're not feeling right and so many people People go to their doctors and they say that they feel off and their traditional doctors just say well it's just part of getting older or it's in your head and I was taught early on in medical school listen to your patient they will tell you what's wrong with them and people think that depression looks a certain way that it has to be crying spells or just you know in bed all day and it actually in younger women shows up as these anger attacks or irritability and it can also show up as random anxiety I've seen it in my patients. I also had it in myself. Um, just random flight anxiety will come out of nowhere, like in your 30s or 40s. Uh, and then difficulty sleeping, brain fog. I didn't even know what that term brain fog was until I had it lifted. Um, and this is something, it affects men too. Low testosterone uh, also affects men's mood and there's not a lot of guys talking about it because they feel like if their sexual function is good then they're good right and they don't really want to talk about their mood not being good right a lot of uh, a lot of patients you know they, they they'll tell you what they feel you just have to ask them so we're like detectives mm -hmm. as doctors uh, I have many patients who, who come in and and you know, they beat around the bush and I have to really get it into them and look at them face to face. And you mentioned that in your lecture today. Too many physicians today don't listen to the patients. And it's very important 
uh, about uh, about listening to patients. You mentioned some statistics about that. Can you just yeah. uh, come back on those stats about? Absolutely, it's mind blowing. The average time that a physician will take to listen to a patient before they interrupt is only 11 seconds. 11 seconds. That's uh, pretty amazing. And then the average visit time is anywhere between 6 minutes and 11 to 12 minutes. And that's if they don't look at their cell phones or the computer and input as they're talking to the patients. And the criteria for diagnosing depression and bipolar disorder are very similar to all of the symptoms of hormonal, hormonal decline and the women's health questionnaire that is used in th several hormone studies to diagnose and, and monitor a hormone uh, balance and response to medication or hormones. So you, you feel that many patients are actually misdiagnosed and put on these SSRI drugs which alter uh, the, the brain function in general. Absolutely. Well, if you're only listening for 11 seconds, and the other thing I, I didn't mention is, you know, the, the healthcare system today, they're transitioning to, you only are allowed to have one complaint when you go to the doctor now. You can't complain about anything. You have to have a whole separate visit for that. We're like trying to put people in a box as quickly as possible rather than listening to them. So many of the disease states and menopause and andropause or just hormonal decline is not a disease state you know we need to get away from that thinking and um, so many people just get boxed into that diagnosis if you only have 11 seconds you know and and are only able to complain about one thing then you're gonna get boxed into depression bipolar or something rather than being um, taken care of and my main theme is you deserve to be celebrated not medicated Right, that's a great point. I have, I have many patients who uh, ages 20 to, to 60, and they'll, they'll present with uh, depression and uh, anxiety symptoms, and they're looking for drugs today. And as you know, the, the medical field, doctors are just prescribing and pushing a lot of these medications. Pharmaceutical representatives are pus pushing a lot of these medications. You know, in our field of more of like prevention and getting proactive with our health, we're, we're seeking out real, real diagnoses and treating the patients and improving their function. Uh, based on your, your patient base, what are the, what's the age group who you find have these complaints of like anxiety, depression? It's pretty frequent. I would say that you know the majority of my patients have had it at least one time, um, but I you know if I had to quantify it, probably eighty to eighty five percent. And what age I mean, group do you, do you find that? Um, I see. I treat people from anywhere from about twenty to seventy or eighty. Uh, I have a whole group of women that are you know seventies and they feel like they're finally you know they're just waking up to their lives. So you know, I have a, a big span. And the other thing that you mentioned is prevention. You know I talk to people about body awareness and feeding their body not only just the good foods um, but exercise and also behavior modifications because I feel like when I empower people to be involved in their care and to actually listen to the messages of their body and listen to how they respond to sugar to gluten to you know whatever it is that gives them such a, a sense of, of power uh, and, and that also makes more of a change. If I just tell them to like do this, this diet, they're not gonna do it. When they get the awareness of, oh, I don't feel good after I eat this or I do that, then that gives them the power of making their own choice. So Dr. Stalker, can you, can you tell us in the, in the audience, uh, from the start to finish, a patient comes into the office, what's your evaluation like, you know, the steps? So this is my favorite part because, you know, I used to be a traditional physician where I'd go through the, the checklist of past medical history, past surgical history, and now when somebody walks into my office, I ask them, tell me your story. And that usually kind of stuns people. They've never been able to speak so long without being interrupted. And they'll tell you what's important to them. Wherever they start in their story, it's what's important to them. And then I end with, what are your goals? Because they may have started off with my hair's falling out, but their goals are I want to have great sex. You know, it's, it, you'll get a whole bunch of information in just asking that one question. And then I also um, end with what are your dreams? Because half the people are on just this hamster wheel of life and not really truly 
thriving and, and living it. And they haven't even thought about what their dream is. So now I have people that they come to me midlife, you know, 40s, 50s, they still have half their life left. And when I ask them their, that question, some of them, their eyes will light up and they'll say, I really want to do this other thing. And that's what I tell them. I'm the catalyst between where you are and where you want to be. So the listening, so yes, you're listening, getting listening. the history. How many minutes do you think that takes about? I generally spend at least 60 to 90 minutes with all of that and I, because I ask all yeah, of the questions about their lifestyle. Which is a lot longer than typical offices. Yeah, I ask about their lifestyle, um, their relationships, their nutrition, their fitness. And then, of course, I do the lab testing. I do a comprehensive yeah, let's, let's, yeah, so, yeah. so we do the we, we do the whole evaluation. Mm -hmm. And now you diagnostic tests. What mm -hmm. kind of diagnostic tests do you do to evaluate the patients? So I do a physical exam, a uh, standard physical exam, and then all of the comprehensive metabolic panel. Um, is that what you're talking lab about? Testing, so lab and then, testing. Besides labs, now what kind of how are you assessing their brain function? Any any tests on the brain to look at their neurocognitive index or different types of memory uh, or reaction time? Any any specific brain test do you I do on the patients? I have used that in the past. I haven't used that um, currently, but I've used the the cognitive um, scoring and. You know, it, it definitely showed an improvement. If we can't measure it, you know, we can't track the progress of it. So it's something yeah, so that I, I'm getting more into neurotropics and, and looking into how to assess that. So I know you were using uh, the CNS vital sign test, which is, is how we look at our brain function. And then basically we look at, uh, there's a new test called WAVI. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. heard about this, but it looks at brain age. It's a computerized mm -hmm. test, but it can tell you what your brain age is. Okay. I've noticed a lot of my patients on hormone replacement therapy, their brain age is a lot younger. Mm -hmm. They're sleeping better, they're increasing their natural growth hormones, and mm -hmm. they're really improving uh, their, their brain function. Mm -hmm. Besides brain testing, do you do any cardiac, pulmonary, physiologic testing? I've done VO2 testing in the past, mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that I would like to, to kind of re-add to my practice. Uh, and that's something, I, I have mixed results with that because we're in such a uh, convenience world these days that some people don't really want to take the, ta take the time to do the, the follow-up testing, mm -hmm. but I have seen that that is uh, a marker for, uh, for progress and also as a motivator. Um, I do use the bioimpedance analyzer, which is really, really helpful in my practice and that checks your percent body fat your lean muscle mass and then your BMR or basal metabolic rate mm -hmm. because especially women in West Hollywood if we gain a pound or two I'm not saying me I'm just saying a lot of women if they are weighing themselves daily and they gain a pound or two they will freak out um, with this machine you're able to actually show them its percent body fat and lean muscle mass um, so you actually can see the the difference with that so what you're telling me is you're basically a real doctor a doctor who listens to the patient examines the patient is not interested in all these fancy expensive tests that cost no. tons of money you actually sit down talk to the patient get a diagnosis and treat the patient and get results so you're the real traditional doctor out there different from the current doctors who spend 11 seconds order a ton of tests and, and they don't have the answers so I have a question. How did you get the name Juicy Jill? <laughs> it's actually from my patients. I was at, at you know, I would be at, at events, and they would introduce. They would be so excited by the results that they had gotten that they would say, "Oh my gosh, it's my Juicy Hormone Doctor!" And then it just became Doctor Juicy Jill. And men and women both resonate with it, and they come back to my practice and they say. I'm feeling kind of juicy. And it's that inner vitality for life. Because like I said, I, I really wake people up physically, hormonally, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and sexually. As I mentioned before, you know, sexual health is so important and vital and not even discussed in medical school. I don't remember the training for it. And it's such like a hush-hush thing. And it's such an important part of your life and your inner vitality. So. Um, yes, for women, it is for the dry vaginas. And sometimes I have to say it just like that because women yeah. are even speaking to another woman, they kind of get embarrassed. They don't even realize like that was a problem or they feel ashamed about it. And that's our body. So, that's, that's, so that's, yes, that's it is good. for that reason too. <laughs> it could be. You know, so I've noticed uh, in, in my career, 
in my career, uh, one of the things that we, we look at is uh, uh, data, scientific research, mm -hmm. papers presented in peer-reviewed medical journals. And you mentioned one thing today about the Women's Health Initiative in the 1990s, and I actually gave a lecture on women and heart disease, and I found out that the media basically comes in and, and changes everything, confuses the patient. And one of the things we found out was something called the timing interval in women with hormone therapy. Mm -hmm. And if, if, you, if you do the correct timing interval, you can reduce uh, cancer as well as heart attack in women because the number one cause of death in women is heart disease. Breast cancer mm -hmm. is, is approximately one in 33, heart attack is one in three. So I really focus in on, on basically getting the patient to, to understand the medical literature. Mm -hmm. Because of your, of your training and because of the time you're spending with the patient, you were able to look at the literature and, and look into that compared to the busy insurance-based doctor mm -hmm. who who's, has no time to look at the data. So one of the benefits, and I know we're running out of time here, but um, how do you feel about that, uh, the new timing interval in, in treating women within six to nine year window Mm -hmm. before the biology of the estrogen receptor changes from a protector mm -hmm. to a monster. Oh, absolutely. I think it's really critical, and I, and I speak to that, but I also um, stress the importance that it's never too, you're never too young and you're never too old to actually be optimized um, because people think that they have to be in their 40s or 50s um, to be optimized, and this stuff starts earlier. Uh, and even if they're only, you know, a lot of the, the older population, they were taught that, oh, I can just get through it and I didn't need anything, but you deserve to live a full, vibrant life at any age. So even if you're past that window, I still, I still treat patients because they still deserve, and they're off traveling the world now. So it's, it, it is important, and I, and I talk to them about the importance of that. Um, but I don't restrict my treatment to just that, that window. Well, I think it's great. I think you, 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 you did fantastic today with your talk. Okay. I think you're in, a, in, a, in the right track. Doctors need to understand what we're doing is preventing the disease and treating the patient when they're healthy and keeping them healthy as they get older. Uh, mm -hmm. There's doctors who do disease management medicine. They'll, they'll treat the illness, and you need those doctors. And there's doctors like yourself and, and me who do a, a preventative uh, focus and being proactive with our help. I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you did great. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for having me.